Um, yeah, so hello. Uh, before I get started, I should apologize for kind of the uh, last minute nature of the slides here. They're not going to be the prettiest things that you've ever seen. Uh, I just flew in from San Francisco, uh, and boy, are my arms tired. Uh, yeah, that's a joke we always make, laughing our arms, but anyone who's tried to program on a plane knows exactly what I mean as you're wedged shaped with those little seats. You don't. Anyway, uh, could we have the next slide, please? You don't have the clicker? I do. <laughs> this is the clicker. Missing the USB stick. So I am a principal engineer for the front end at DNA Nexus. Uh, this means I basically lead the front end team. I've been with the company for almost eight years now. Uh, the original code base was uh, code that I worked on. And I'm going to talk about migrating from that code base, which is near and dear to my heart, into a more modern stack using React. Uh, next, please. <laughs> the problem. <laughs> next. Um, so, what do you do when that great app that you built isn't so great anymore? Now, at DNA Nexus, we have a code base that was made in 2012 using all of the latest and greatest technologies of 2012. We used jQuery, we used knockout.js, we used um, Bootstrap, we used a whole bunch of stuff that was really cool at the time. It's not really so cool anymore. It's not as functional. It's become difficult to maintain. And we'd really like to uh, try and migrate. Um, other reasons that you might want to migrate are unsupported technology. If something that you're using has fallen by the wayside, people aren't developing it anymore. Um, lack of talent in existing technologies. People move on. It's really difficult to find people who are enthusiastic about jQuery anymore. Few people can even admit to knowing it anymore. Um, and trying to court people to work on those technologies can be difficult. Um, it can be difficult to maintain old code bases, uh, partially because of the talent problem, partially because old code bases just have a way of ballooning and suddenly you have that section of code that you're not really sure what it does anymore because you wrote it five years ago. Um, and it could just be time. Sometimes you might want to migrate just because you want to keep current. Uh, next slide, please. Also, porting code is time consuming, which is why you might want to consider an incremental upgrade like this. Uh, or as my colleague Martin put it, uh, how to build a new plane while flying the old one. Um, however, it takes a long time to port an entire application, especially a mature application, over to a new code base. And that can be a difficult thing to sell to your product management team. Very few teams are going to say, oh yes, we will halt development for a year and a half while you write this thing over again that we already have, and we just won't add any more features for a year and a half. That's, that's not going to fly, I'm sorry. Next solution, yeah. So, the solution. Almost came through. Um, incremental transition. And this is what we've been working on uh, at DNA Nexus for a little while now. Um, new features can be developed in your new code base, so you get to reap the advantages of the technologies that you're moving to almost immediately. Uh, as your product team says, hey, we need this feature. Okay, now we need this feature. You get to build those using the new framework while still maintaining the old one, which is great. Um, old features can be ported over incrementally when you have time. Uh, this means that it also works well with an agile development practice. So uh, if something comes in and you had some porting work scheduled, uh, but you need to now tackle this very important thing, uh, you can defer the porting work and you can have the old features in place and it will continue to work. Um, and of course, each code base can exist side by side and sometimes talk back and forth to, to one another. Um, so let's go through the uh, environments that we have. Uh, like I said, uh, this is actually a snapshot of what we have at DNA Nexus. So over here we've got CopyScript and Knockout.js and Bootstrap. Uh, and you see a whole bunch of stuff here, which was great seven years ago. Uh, and um, like how many people use EaselJS now? Or I don't even know what it is. Right? <laughs> exactly. Well over here, we've got all the nice, cool stuff uh, that everyone wants to use. We've got ES6, we're moving to TypeScript. Uh, we've got React, we've got Sagas. D3 uh, is always cool, I'm sorry. It's just, it's a packet one. Um, and we've got Webpack and Babel. Um, 
these are two very different frameworks. Uh, you can see that there is almost nothing in common between these two. In fact, I don't think there is anything in common between these two. We use Lodash. Well, we Lodash and Rambo. We don't, we don't use Lodash, it's just stuff that's comported from all right. <laughs> and never rewritten the runtime. All right, so we got the peanut gallery over here. Um, so how do we actually reconcile these two things? Uh, let's go to step one, which is setting up the environment. Um, so, uh, you have your old application running. Uh, in our case, we're serving straight up HTML through Nginx. Uh, we have that running on port 443, which I'm sure you will all recognize as the HTTPS port. Uh, for your dev environment, you'll need to set up a server on a new port to uh, make sure that you can have the new code running uh, without interfering with the old code. Um, thank you. Uh, so, what you'll need to do is choose a path where all of the new code will reside, basically. This is going to be a, a path in your URL, URL where the uh, server will basically punch through the old code and direct the user to the new code base. Uh, so, in effect, uh, we chose PANX. Uh, that's uh, our code name for our new project is PANXM, uh, so that, that's the abbreviation. Um, so in fact, any URL that starts with PANX here will be using the new code base. Um, you'll then need to add a new public path in the Webpack config saying, hey, this is where we should uh, put everything and where we should reference our files when we compile everything. Um, All right, there we go. Uh, next, we go to sharing information. So you'll definitely need to share some information if you have any sort of uh, complex or mature web application. Uh, in our case, this is stuff like our login token. Uh, we don't want to make the user log in every time they switch environments. That would be terrible. You know, you click on a link, oh, I have to log in again. You click on another link, oh, I have to log in again. Uh, that's not going to work very well. Um, so, I recommend using the, the uh, sort of setup that I just detailed uh, so that you can use the same uh, server name, the same port, basically as far as the front end application is concerned on the user's computer, it is the same server. Uh, all the magic happens in the back end, which is great. Um, we like to use local storage for things like authentication details. We try to avoid using cookies, especially after the Heartbleed uh, incident a couple of years ago, if anyone remembers that. Um, yeah, I see some people nodding. <laughs> um, yeah, so local storage is where it's at. Uh, and we, we try to avoid sending cookies as much as possible. I highly encourage that as a, a standard development practice. Um, but storing stuff in local storage will ensure that both your old code base and your new code base can access the same information at the same time. Um, so let's move on to step three, which is tying it all together. So this is the secret sauce, Nginx reverse proxy. Um, what we've got here is a location in Nginx, uh, which will say, take anything coming in that starts with PANX, or whatever prefix you've chosen, and now route it to this server that you're running. And this is for development purposes. Um, and this means that you can simultaneously run your old server while saying, Anything that goes here, use the new server. And it will be seamless from the uh, client's perspective. The user won't know that anything is different, uh, but Nginx will selectively take stuff from one server or the other. Um, you may also have to add uh, something to get your initial JavaScript bundle. Uh, so for example, you have your new app, index.js, uh, and you may have to add some extra routing there. We did. But the, the theory is fundamentally the same. You know, the new code base is something that Nginx will seamlessly route the user towards, and that's exactly what Nginx does well. Uh, as far as production, um, it's very easy. You just deploy the assets to a directory matching the directory name uh, that shows as your prefix, prefix uh, so PANX, and you can see it right here. So for the normal server, we have like our index right here, our 
uh, image assets. The formatting is a little off here, I apologize for that. Uh, this should all be shifted over by one indent. Uh, so this should all be on the same level as the images. Apologies. Um, but yeah, so this is a directory that is residing as a subdirectory of your, your main web application. And that ensures that uh, basically the references that are created in your development server when you compile to Webpack will now get routed properly and go to the proper places here. All right, so let's talk about some pitfalls of this approach because no approach is perfect. Uh, and this is certainly not a perfect approach, believe me. <laughs> So the first one is load times. Um, as you switch between environments, you will be basically be loading that environment's web application over again. Now, ideally, caching should help with this. The user will download all the resources once, and then it should be very fast thereafter. It's not always going to be the case, and it's still going to cause a disruption as the uh, environment spins up. It loads up the original, uh, you know, it loads up the initial code and tries to execute it and then tries to draw everything in the, on the page. Um, so it's not great, but uh, it's, it's a small price to pay for the, the convenience of being able to incrementally upgrade. Uh, another problem is routing. So especially with React and React Router, the default is to route things internally. Now, when you're talking about switching between two applications, that other application is going to be an external route. Uh, React Router is not going to be able to help you there. Um, one thing that we've done is we've come up with a component which can selectively route internally or externally. So if we have a, a route to the old code base, we can say, hey, this is external, and it will break out a React Router and load it appropriately. Uh, and finally, one of the biggest issues is loss of transient information. Now, this is stuff like application state. Uh, is a window, or is a modal open, or you know, what path has the user taken through this application? Basically, anything that's stored in Redux state, uh, or, or your Redux store, as soon as you switch back to the old application, it's lost. Um, this can be mitigated by storing information in local storage about the user's state, or even better, session storage, uh, but that is, still not perfect, and it's, it means that you have to pay extra attention to what sorts of things you want to persist between switching from one environment to the other. All right, so I hope that's been a helpful guide to incrementally transitioning from an old application to a new one, especially a, a React-based one. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I also am happy to answer them later. I have a Twitter account. I don't think I've used it for years. Uh, feel free to DM me. I'll probably get back to you probably before 2025, but I make no guarantees. Uh, a better way to reach me is if the, with my email address there. Uh, so feel free to ask me any questions if you want to try this yourself and uh, you have a question for me later on. Uh, please do reach out. I am more than happy to help. I actually have a question. Uh, from what I understood, uh, you did page by page, right? Yes. In terms of uh, sorry, no, no, no. Uh, how about if you have quite big page where you have a lot of functionality and you want to increment, incrementally transition that particular page uh, piece by piece? Mm -hmm. uh, any option we can think about? So I would say that depends on what you, what technologies you're using as your old code base. Uh, for us, that was not a possibility. Um, our old code base was just too different from React to make that practical. Um, if you have something that's a little more similar to React or something that uh, you could integrate React into very easily, uh, you could uh, look at doing that. If you can do anything with web components, uh, you might be able to leverage that technology as well. Uh, a quick and dirty way of doing it would be to replace just sections of the page with iframes. That, that's really going down a route you probably don't want to go down, <laughs> but if you absolutely have to do it, that's uh, kind of a last ditch solution. Um, otherwise, I'm afraid uh, the only answer I can give is that you might have to spend a lot of time up front developing the framework uh, and making everything work 
uh, as similar as possible. Uh, and that's actually an issue we had to tackle as well. So uh, our site has a, a header that is the same across all pages. Uh, and we are now in the position where we have to maintain that in the old version and the new version, if you want to add something to the header, we have to change two different code bases. Um, it's a bit of a pain, but uh, it's, it's kind of the price of, of slowly migrating. And what's your practice if then if you want to improve some existing page, you have to remove this page uh, to the new one, right? Because yeah. otherwise you would uh, actually work with the old state. Yeah, exactly. If it's a small change, it may be worth just making the change in the old code base and saying we'll get to it later when we port that page over. If it's a significant change, that might be a good time to pitch moving that page over to the product management team or whoever is in charge of those decisions. Uh, one thing that we've found to be very useful is uh, taking uh, a page and if our design team has some suggestions for how to improve it, also taking the opportunity to make those improvements when we, we do the new version. Uh, and those can be very powerful selling points for a product team saying, yes, we will absolutely make these improvements or these changes, but here's what we need to do in order to do that. Any more questions? Why haven't you, or have you tried the approach of being a React being a master and basically turning off the old code base on the specific group? Because right now, and if I understand our code base correctly, mm -hmm. it's a three, three different, uh, completely opposite. The old code base is the master. And then whatever gets as a new one, then it just gets served by the by the Nginx because Nginx is still playing in the background. Exactly. Have you, have you tried to do a different approach because I've seen it work before? Right. But especially I was going especially in my work with uh, with the old code base as it's not that dynamic. Basically, serving uh, fully built J JavaScript with HTML files. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem with insider knowledge. We have some people here who uh, know a little bit more about the code base and can ask very pointed questions, uh, which I, I love. Thank you. Um, and so that's a very good question. Um, that is absolutely a viable route uh, and one you may want to, to look at going down if you choose to do this. Um, in our case, there are a couple of reasons why we decided not to do that. So. Uh, Actually, a couple of reasons that are all rooted in the same reason, I, I guess. Um, it would have entailed building out extra um, infrastructure that we just haven't had the time for. Um, the uh, new application was initially written with some very stringent deadlines, uh, and we didn't have the time to develop them at that point. And uh, right now, going back and redoing that and transitioning over, uh, is not something that we really have the uh, effort to spare. It doesn't make sense right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, at some point, it's going to have to happen. I mean, if you're going to port the application over, at some point you're going to have to make the new application sort of the match application and uh, put the old application as, as sort of the, the outlier. Um, we haven't hit that point yet. I'm looking forward to the point when we do, uh, but unfortunately it's not. What would be disappointing in your opinion? Like, would it define it by, let's say, percentage of code or percentage of features ported, or like the major features ported? I would say it would be by percentage of features ported, uh, and also the time, uh, getting the free time to develop the infrastructure. Uh, so, for example, we would probably need to develop uh, our login pages, uh, you know, some of the supporting framework to, to do that. We would definitely need to. Uh, develop a uh, sense of is the user logged in or not because right now every page is a page where the user has to be logged in but that's not the case for all of our applications or, or sorry all of our application uh, like our login page our registration page those are inherently pages where the user can't be logged in in order to see them uh, we don't have that sense in our application yet um, that's something that we would need to develop before really using the React application to encompass <laughs> You're the one who asked. But I know, I know, I know, I know the answer. I just thought it would be interesting for me. Yep. You also had some follow-up questions, so I was seeing if you were done. I am done. All right. Any other questions? If not,
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.